Good afternoon. I'm Mona Suclaris. I'm on faculty at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. And I've worked with um, adult pulmonologists and pediatric allergists over the past um, 17 years. And what I'm going to be talking about today is asthma myths. Pretty much what we're going to be doing is trying to talk about um, dispelling the myths, fables, and fairy tales associated with asthma. And I'm going to go through and recap some of the asthma myths, and then what I'm going to do is present to you some scientific evidence about why they're myths and try to give you information that when you go back to your communities, you'll be able to share some of that information with your uh, patients. So when they come in and they think something is true that isn't, you'll be able to point them in the right direction of um, what's actually true. So one of the asthma myths is everybody's asthma is the same. And as we know, everybody's asthma is not the same. And in fact, the Asthma in America study was updated in 2004 to include children. And the study was um, started, well actually it, it, it was involving uh, 41,000 telephone calls to people in the United States to identify families that had asthma. They um, came out with a, a sample of about 800 families that were representative of the United States, um, people in, in the United States with asthma. And one of the questions they asked them was, um, in the past 12 months, have your, has your child, they asked questions of the parent um, for children for the most part, and then the 16 through 18 year olds, they actually asked the child. And what they did was they asked the question, in the past year, has your child had any sudden severe episodes of asthma? And they pretty much listed out the symptoms of asthma. Sudden, acute episodes of asthma. And as you can see, 54% of the population, this is randomly selected patients, uh, said within the past year they actually had a sudden severe episode of wheezing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, and among some of the other symptoms that they mentioned. Um, what they did then for people that said yes was they went through and said, well, how often has those experience, have had you actually experienced those symptoms? And what you can see is, and it's actually very troubling, people that had symptoms once a month or more comprise a very large percentage of the population. And this is random digit dialing as far as um, random selection of the population. So I think it's important to recognize not only are, are not all asthma patients um, similar, as we just learned um, with Dr. Weir's presentation as well with phenotyping, but when you look at just their clinical presentation of symptoms, there's quite a bit of variety. And unfortunately, um, the people that are having symptoms infrequently are, are a very small uh, proportion of the, of the patients. Another uh, common myth is asthma is not a serious condition. And anybody that has asthma that has been in the emergency room hopefully will tell you it is a serious uh, condition. If they've been in the, in the hospital, they'll tell you that it's a serious condition. And it's serious not just because of the health effects and the humanistic effects of the decrease in quality of life and the mortality, but also because asthma prevalence is increasing. And just a month ago, the CDC released new information in the MMWR that shows that asthma prevalence in children has gone up a point since 2001 to 2009. Adults has gone up a point. And when we look at some of the specific subgroups that, that are experiencing some of the increases in, in um, prevalence, we can see that children have increased from 2001 to 2009, 1%, it doesn't seem like much, but it's an increase in prevalence that continues previous trends. Um, another thing to pay attention to is black children had a prevalence increase of almost 50% in that period of time. Um, they were one of the largest hard hit um, areas, uh, the one, one of the largest hard hit um, subgroups. So it's really important to recognize that black children are disproportionately affected and I think this is a very important conference since we are talking about health disparities. We need to be sure that we're targeting um, people for appropriate treatment. Um, adults prevalence increased by about a percent. Poor adults though, I didn't have the 2001 numbers, but poor adults, the prevalence is actually higher than adults in general at 11%. And when we look at women, the prevalence is 10%. So asthma is a serious condition and the prevalence is increasing and that's troubling. Um, nobody dies from asthma anymore is another asthma myth. And as we heard for the last two speakers, people do die from asthma. And in fact, fortunately, 
We do have a reduction in the number of asthma deaths occurring over time. Um, asthma deaths were increasing up until the mid-1900s, and it looked like originally it was maybe stabilizing. It might even look like it's not just stabilizing, but maybe even coming down, thank God. But even in 2007, we have 3,400 patients that are dying every year of asthma, and 185 of them are, ki are kids. When we look at this on a daily basis, nine people every day die of asthma, and that's just unacceptable. People that have asthma that die of asthma are almost always predictable, and it's almost always preventable. Our last couple of speakers have talked about those kinds of things as well. So I think it's really important to recognize, even though the trend looks like it's coming down, we've got a long way to go until we get down to zero. So it's really important that we do embrace the, the therapies that we know that can make a difference, adhere to the guidelines that are published, and make sure that our patients and our, our, our colleagues are doing the same thing to help people optimize their therapy. Um, most people are in control of, her, of their asthma. Um, this is also from the Children and Asthma in America study that was done in 2004. And the question was, I don't know what happened there. I have a couple of things there that look like they're duplicated. Um, they pretty much asked the patient lots of questions, questions about their asthma symptoms over the last year. They asked them questions about their uh, perceived asthma severity. And unfortunately, what we see here is the NIH severity classification, mild, mild intermittent, mild persistent, moderate and severe persistent asthma, as it was decided based on the symptom frequency that the patient said that they were having during, this, during the survey. What they have on the y-axis is the percent of patients responding. And as you can see, the, the red or the pink bars show people that think that they were completely controlled. The people in the blue bars think that they were well controlled. Now which group here are the people that were completely or well controlled? It should only be the people in the mild intermittent group. We have people, 10% of people in severe persistent disease think that their asthma is well controlled, completely controlled, and 38% thought that it was well controlled. So these are things that we need to make sure that we're addressing when we're working with patients to say, your asthma might not be well controlled. And to apply the guidelines, make sure we ask the questions so that we can determine whether or not asthma is controlled or not, and make sure people don't change their expectations for their, their care to say, well, I feel all, all the time bad, and that's good for me. That, that's not acceptable. So asthma is not always uh, well controlled. In fact, patients don't perceive their symptoms sometimes the way uh, we would like them to. Another myth is asthma is a psychological condition, or asthma is all in your head. And in fact, there's studies that have been looking at <coughs> the person's self-reported emotional state. This was a study that looked at airway resistance in a group of subjects, both asthmatic and normal. People that had, um, they were exposed to video scenarios as well as some mentally challenging stress tests. So if I asked you to say, I want you to count backwards from 100 by seven in front of everybody here in the room, that would be a little bit thought me mentally challenging to some of us. Um, so what they did was they asked the patients to do that. And at the same time, they were measuring their airway resistance. And what interestingly we see, and they asked them to self-report what their mental state was at the time that they had the airway resistance measured. And what's interesting is people that were not asthmatic had their airway resistance go up. On the y-axis, it's essentially a measure of airway resistance. It was oscillatory resistance, if you're interested. Um, but in essence, what we have is even people with normal, that aren't asthmatic as far as we know, we have increase in airway resistance in a situation of stress. People with asthma have an exaggerated response. It was significant in every single one of the emotions measured. Does this mean that asthma is caused by emotions? No, it is not. But it does mean that there's some credence to the, the feeling that some people say, if I'm particularly sad, if I'm laughing hard, a lot of times my asthma will act up. And in fact, there's some scientific basis to say that the myth, as far as it's all in your head, probably wrong, but emotions do affect asthma. Um, another study that was done on the same, on the same um, uh, theme as far as asthma and emotions in the uh, child, children and, and um, asthma in America study, 
they ask the patients, as a result of your asthma, how do you feel? What emotions do you feel? And unfortunately, what we see here is a percent of patients on the Y response, on the Y axis, um, embarrassed, isolated, or alone, fearful, angry, or depend depressed, or dependent. And the the yellow, I mean, the, the uh, pink is is often, and blue is sometimes, and and the light blue is rarely. And you can see that a significant proportion, 20 percent, 16 percent, 30 percent, as a result of their asthma, have psychological impact and that shouldn't be surprising because asthma affects your psyche if you're not well controlled you have reasons to be upset and depressed if you can't do what you're supposed to do I got an email from somebody recently whose granddaughter is in the hospital all the time and she wanted to know what to do and she's been to some of the best places in the country and I'm like I'm sorry I don't know what else to tell you except for look at the clinical trials and keep going to those specialists <laughs> Let them know you're interested in, in being aggressive and, and try to do something. But it has an emotional toll on people. The steroids used in asthma are the same as what we use in the gym. And fortunately, I can tell you that's not true either. Um, anabolic steroids are used for their androgenic quality. They're masculinizing. They're used for cell growth properties also, which make um, people grow muscles. And everybody can recognize this young gentleman mm -hmm. um, many years ago who was a, an athlete and bodybuilder. I'm not saying on this slide in any way that he used uh, anabolic <laughs> steroids, um, but of course not. <laughs> of course not. Um, but I want to make sure you know that bodybuilders tend to use these things. They're substances of abuse, and they are not used for therapeutic purposes. Um, corticosteroids, fortunately, have wonderful anti-inflammatory properties that we capitalize to have wonderful things happen. Um, this is an inflamed airway. The, if the um, epithelial layer and cilia are, are, are desquamated over here is three months of beclomethasone dipropionate treatment. You can see that the airway epithelium is starting to look healthier. The eosinophils are going away. And it's one of those things that we have good corticosteroids, okay? The ones in the gym are not the same drugs. I was thinking about showing you the, the chemical structure, but I figured nobody would care. Um, so I decided not to do that. Asthma medicine is addictive. Another asthma myth. Asthma medicine, um, in order to say whether it's addictive or not, I think I need to give you the definitions. Addiction is defined as the uncontrollable, compulsive drug seeking and use, even in the face of negative health and social consequences. I don't think, maybe except for short acting beta agonists and people that refuse to use inhaled steroids, we would ever describe a patient as being addicted to their asthma medicines. Um, Dependence, after repeated use, discontinuation of the drug results in physiological action of withdrawal. We don't see that in asthma. Tolerance, after repeated use, increasing doses are required to achieve the same effect. And um, asthma controllers, we don't have any evidence of any of these three, um, these, any of these three types of, of, um, of negative connotations. Tolerance, on the other hand, has been demonstrated with the beta agonists, both short-acting beta agonists and the long-acting beta agonists. So what I have here is a, it's an in vitro study that was done in human lung tissue. Um, they didn't exactly say how they got the tissue, except they got it from a bank. So I'm assuming these were cadaver studies. Um, bronchodilation was measured, and they looked at um, relaxation of the airways. And again, this was an in vitro study. They incubated the tissue with albuterol for anywhere between three hours and 12 hours. And then they evaluated whether or not bronchoconstriction uh, bronco, um, occurred, and they looked to see how much relaxation they could get. 